world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to Rebank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to Rebank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Today we're thrilled to be joined by Robin Toombs. Robin is a serial technology entrepreneur and investor. He's the CEO and co-founder of Yodi, a digital identity platform enabling secure onboarding anywhere online or in person. Prior to starting Yodi, Robin co-founded Gamesys, one of the world's leading online gaming operators. He's also an angel investor in a handful of technology companies and a trustee of Future First. Today's conversation is a fascinating glimpse into what the future of data, privacy, and identity might look like. Connect with us on Twitter, at Rebank Podcast, or on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your podcast platform of choice and leave us a review. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Robin Toombs. Robin, welcome to Rebank. Nice to meet you, Will. You're the co-founder and CEO of Yodi, a digital identity company. Tell us about Yodi. Okay, so Yoti, we set up Yoti in uh, the summer of 2014, partly because uh, one of my co-founders, Noel Hayden and myself, have been running another business where we have to uh, check the identity of customers online. And we do about 300,000 of those checks a year. And we very quickly realized that it's very difficult to check that information because it's mainly a little bit of knowledge that somebody puts into a web form and that opens up um, the opportunity for fraudsters to use somebody else's information to create accounts without their knowledge to potentially commit fraud. So we kind of always knew that was a problem on the internet and it hasn't really been solved up till now. Um, And then three years ago, our other co-founder, Duncan, took me out to a um, a Spartan race and about 10 to 15,000 people were having to basically queue up and prove their identity so that they could sign a waiver for injury in case they had a problem on the day. And um, that was quite a painful process for them, bringing along their passports, driving licenses, standing in a queue, signing bits of paper, having that check to their face, to their signature on the document, and then having to store that document away while they ran off through the, through the streams and the mud. And um, we kind of came away and thought, that system's not good. We need to now look at the biometrics, the smartphones, and see whether we can create a digital identity, which would solve a lot of those problems. Wow. All right. So I think there are a lot of interesting angles to pick up there. So you mentioned your your other business and doing 300,000 online checks, was it a, a year? Yeah. What's that? What's that other business? So that business is an online bingo business, and we've been uh, running that business as founders since two thousand and one. Uh, and you know, sixteen, seventeen years later, there are twelve hundred staff in that business. It does um, you know hundreds of millions of pounds worth of revenue, and uh, it's it's a very profitable business. And actually, that's allowed Noel and I to to kind of take this risk to basically launch Yoti. So I think it would have been very difficult four years ago to go to VCs and say, look, we think there's probably about 20 really difficult technical challenges to kind of resolve over the next hopefully two years. Um, I think most VCs would have looked and said, guys, that that's horribly risky. Um, come back in a year or two when you've fixed all of them or three quarters of them, then maybe we could have a talk. So we kind of looked and thought that's going to be that's going to be tough. So actually, let's use some of our own funding initially, and let's quarter by quarter see if we can fix uh, those technical challenges. And if we do, let's then go starting uh, start to talk to some of the businesses who would be interested in this type of solution. And you know, luckily, that's kind of you know, it's been a long process. It's taken three, three and a half years to do, not two. 
but um, actually now that we've got the solution, um, it's a really useful thing for many businesses and they're, um, they're showing good interest in it. Yeah. Well, it, it, I mean, it's such a pain point and friction point for so many users, so many businesses everywhere on, on the internet and, and in person to an extent as well. Um, it's, it's one of those, you know, it feels like one of those kind of chicken and egg challenges, you know, kind of like, I don't know, broad based adoption of blockchain or something like it, it works when everyone uses it, uh, when there are only hand people, a handful of people using it, unfortunately it's not solving any problems for, for anyone. So the, the, the audacity effectively re- required to show up and say, all right, we are going to solve this problem for the world potentially uh we're going to create a universal solution that's going to work uh it's going to it's going to be you know recognized by by regulators by um you know compliance officers uh it's going to help people pass kyc and aml checks all sorts of things with with legal and and pecuniary implications uh if if you get it wrong i mean that's a huge challenge so so how do you how do you approach something like that on day one I think luckily we never thought that through as hard as we should because we'd have probably thought, good heavens, that's just such a horrifically challenging thing to do. But we, you know, in, in fairness, we did realise that that's a big, big problem, the chicken and egg. Even if, even if it's useful for both the business and the individual, the businesses want to see millions of people using a digital identity and the users need to know that businesses will want to recognise their digital identity. So that, that chicken and egg is very difficult. Difficult. We kind of approached it two ways. One, we recognised that there are some businesses in regulated sectors who are really keen to give any kind of method for a person to get through that regulated, know your customer, anti-money laundering type of check. Because if they don't do those checks, then they can't take the person on board. So the regulated sector was a little bit less worried about, have you already got millions of users? Um, although they were obviously very keen to see that people wanted to use um, a digital identity. Presumably that's pretty tough also, though, because the regulated industry often needs, you know, or at least seeks some sort of you know, regulatory sign-off of, of their process. So you know, going to the you know, FCI, I suppose, in, in, um, in the case of anyone in the UK, and saying, got this great new biometric-based uh, onboarding process, and they say, well, I guess we'll kind of need to see it in practice. That's, that's got to be a tough sell. That was very tough indeed. We've spent about three years talking to different regulators. And, you know, the FCA is a really good example of a regulator now who kind of has an approach for, for these type of businesses in the reg tech sector. So I think five or ten years ago, it would have been very difficult to, um, to kind of get funded and to get the ability to last the course whilst you go through that kind of regulator. Get the regulator, uh, get a meeting, actually get them up to speed with your technology, uh, prove that there might be some businesses who are interested in it and actually kind of meet all of their kind of questions and, and kind of tick boxes and finally get into a proof of concept and hopefully eventually get kind of recognized and certified potentially you know if that's a three four five year process most businesses probably gone bust before you know before the end of year one or two so there are some regulators who've been very open because eg they've got sandboxes they've got this process of now having a way of facilitating a startup and saying look you need to go through this process go and find yourself a business which wants to join with you kind of to make sure there is definitely some interest and we'll take you through that sandbox uh, process other regulators less kind of um, far along that path and less likely to have a formal uh, way of doing this so so much harder for a for a startup to know whether they're actually going to get anywhere or not so I I think that's going to improve over time but there's still quite a long way for businesses Noel and I've been very lucky that um, with our kind of ability to fund the business for the first kind of three, four years, we've not had to worry too much about whether some of those regulators take 
two years rather than one year to kind of you know get it and and feel comfortable with it and let people start using it mm-hmm. can, can you describe the the solution for us in in simple terms yeah so very very simply it's a voluntary um system where you choose to basically get your own digital identity to do that you basically take your smartphone and you um, take a picture of yourself. You then put your mobile phone number into the uh, phone. We send you a one-time PIN through an SMS. Uh, You read the PIN, you enter it back into the mobile phone app, and you then put a five-digit PIN into the phone. And that effectively gives you a, a basic Yoti, a basic digital identity. Critically, you can then add your photo ID And what we'll do is we'll then check your photo ID. You have to do a liveness test where you say three random words. um, And we look at that video and check that it really is a living person saying those random words in that short video. And then we match using some fairly clever facial matching software, um, your selfie to your liveness video to your photo ID. And as long as that matches to a high level of confidence, we then also check the authenticity of the documents. So with some documents, e.g. passports, an Android phone can actually read the chip information in the passport, which is a really nice secure thing that they do at the border, but you can also do uh, in our app. Um, Or we have to basically go through kind of manual checks of a photo of the passport but we take several photos and we do several kind of things to check that that document is authentic all right so i'm 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 just thinking out loud i opened a a starling bank account not too long ago and and i remember effectively a you know similar process so so modern uh app only bank they verify your phone number at some point Uh, maybe they verify your email at some point they ask you to take a picture of of an id and to do that kind of video capture slash voice recognition piece uh so so in the starling case it's specific to one institution i.e at the end of it you've opened a starling account uh but in your case you can effectively use that same identity once you've set it up with any organization that that will accept that as authentication so, so that's the beauty, I think, of the Yoti system. We, when we started the business, we thought, how can we make this the best consumer experience? Because in the end, if consumers decide this is a useful thing for them and they find it easy enough to use and hopefully recommend onto their friends, then we're going to find that we can kind of win, win, win business here. Because smart companies are going to look and say, well, you know, if I'm a big bank, I could probably try and do some of this. And you described, you know, a good case uh, of Starling Bank. But many, many businesses don't want to invest huge amounts of time and effort into trying to do that piece. You know, they may be brilliant at e-commerce or they may be brilliant at something else, but they're not necessarily experts in developing those types of systems and making sure people don't uh, spoof the videos and all of those types of things. So we kind of thought if we can allow consumers to create their identity once, verify it to a strong level, and then issue or or allow that person to then share those verified details with different businesses voluntarily, smart businesses will accept that. It gives them 100% verified kind of matched KYC information, all at the touch of one button. And all of the cost of the onboarding has been transferred to the consumer. But the consumer has only spent three, four, five minutes doing it. And once they've done it, they can then transfer information easily time and time again for years to come. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, I think, where it will end up. I think we will, whether they're all using Yotis or not. I think, you know, half of the world's three and a half billion smartphone users in five to ten years' time will be using a digital identity. We hope quite a few are Yotis, but the logic that I want to take control of my identity on my phone with my biometrics, with high security, and then decide who I'm going to share that verified information, I think that will be the way that people do it in, in years to come. Yeah, and, and I guess the other part of that, uh, presumably, is what yeah, a num- number of people have um, have kind of discussed theoretically, the idea of, okay, once your identity is verified with Yodi, you 
you may or may not in, say, onboarding at a new bank, share all of the information, i.e. your passport picture, your video, your you know voice biometrics. Or maybe if you're making an online purchase, you don't actually share that information, but you share the fact that Yodi has authenticated you. Is that is that so, part of so it? So yeah, critically, it's very, very unlikely that the businesses will ask for too much information. So the beauty of the Yoti system is if I want to know somebody's verified name and I want you know a high degree of confidence that it's been checked, for instance, to passports or driving licenses, I can ask for the verified name and I can see the metadata which says that Yoti has checked that to a passport with a timestamp that might be two years ago. I don't need to ask for a photo image of the passport page with all of the passport details, the expiry, because that's very precious information. It's a hacker's delight to try and get into that type of information. And GDPR now kind of is kind of saying, hey, look, think very carefully whether you want to put that kind of precious information onto servers. Um, as a business, you've got a liability there if that gets stolen, particularly if you're you're not securing it effectively. So I think a lot of businesses will say, hey, we'd much rather just get a verified name. That's good enough for our regulations because it's been checked properly. Um, and if we lose a verified name, actually, that's not that's not quite as bad as losing their verified name, their passport details, their image, and a whole load of other bits that you could see on a passport. Mm-hmm. So, financial services is is one area where this sort of um, capability is is useful. I understand you guys are doing work in both in national identity uh, and also in other private sector areas outside of financial services. You want to talk a bit about that? Sure. So, you know, there's actually lots and lots of uh, sectors where a Yoti is useful. So we, we have one of the largest or the largest UK nightclub chain who is rolling Yoti out to all of their clubs. So that's Deltic. Um, we do age-restricted retail. So the largest um, supermarkets in the UK are keen to use Yoti in proof of in kind of pilots uh, later this year. Um, about 20% of people in supermarket self-checkouts have usually got an age-restricted good in the basket. Often alcohol, but it could be another good. And at the moment, you obviously have to basically, if you're my age, just wave down at the uh, the person at the other end of the manual checkout. But if they're busy, obviously I'm going to have to wait politely until that manual person is finished their job and then they can approve me. So... You know, lots of utility for me be able to to be able to kind of buy those goods, prove that I'm over 18, and then leave the shop without in, in, inconveniencing anybody who's on the manual checkout. Um, we've obviously got marketplaces, so you know, really good examples are classified. So there's a, a classified s- a company called Freeance who basically now use Yoti to verify sellers. So a seller can give confidence to lots and lots of buyers by basically having it verified by Yoti on their kind of adverts. Um, But also, even if I wasn't um, on free ads, if I wanted to check a, you know, kind of um, a person out before I pay them a thousand pounds for something expensive, that could be a, you know, really, really nice bike, or it could be a week's holiday in a rented apartment. I could basically just look at their mobile phone number on their classified ad and I could ask them politely through Yoti to share their verified name. Now, very, very few people when I go to conferences ever put their hand up when I ask at the beginning of the conference, hands up anybody who's a fraudster. It, you know, I never see the hands go up. And, you know, that's always been the case in life that fraudsters don't want to prove Uh, that they're a fraudster in terms of saying, you know, who they definitely are. So if you can do anything to basically check that an honest person who's going to do business with you can give you a limited amount of highly valuable information, a verified name, it's highly unlikely that person is basically going to then scam you. Whereas somebody who can make up their name, more of a chance, not necessarily luckily, you know, a horrific number of people doing that, but enough for it to be fairly painful grit in the system and always an, a kind of an anxiety if you're online having to hope that you're not at risk of somebody doing that to you. 
Um, recruitment, uh, gaming, obviously regulation, keeping people's accounts safe. If I've you know got medical information on a on a uh, an app, I would want to have very strong multi-factor authentication for that. I wouldn't want to make up a bad password. So with Yoti, you don't actually technically have. Um, passwords you don't have a kind of you know a six digit you know um um you know character based thing where you have to keep putting it into the site and hopefully nobody's keystroke logging your your activity on your on your keyboard instead yoti has a unique encrypted kind of relationship for each website that you may well interact with so that's a much more powerful and safe way for you to basically interact um, with websites and you don't have to keep remembering passwords. So, so how, how does that work? Walk us through the you know, online checkout process or sign up process. Yes. Yeah, so, so if I wanted to um, sign up to a, um, let, let's call it an, an e-commerce site, um, they could basically say, well, look, here's the web form and you could immediately start putting in your name and your address and your date of birth and any other information they decide they'd like from you before they are comfortable uh, giving you an account. Or they can put a button saying, you know, use Yoti. And if I've got a Yoti, I can click on that button. So if I'm literally on the phone, I'll click on that button and it will say, hey, we've checked your operating system and you've got Yoti on your um, smartphone. So you now basically can see the information that the company wants. So it appears on your on your phone and it says ABC retailer would like the following name. This is like, like similar to like an OAuth 2.0 sort of paying yeah, across for different apps or something? a similar system, but effectively we try and make it incredibly easy for the user. So the user literally touches the button and then on their phone, they will then see ABC Retailer wants your name, your date of birth, your address. Do you want to share this information? And then you either hit no thanks or you hit allow. And if you hit allow, that transaction will be completed. If you haven't logged into the app at that point, you will have to log in before the share will be completed. That could be either with your fingerprint or it could be with a five digit pin. Um, and at some point we'll do it with your face. And then both parties will basically get issued a receipt. So that receipt for the business, ABC retailer, can effectively go straight through the SDK, the software development kit, into their back-end database um, as if you were doing a web form fill-in. But for me, actually, I get issued a receipt on the phone and therefore I've definitely got good legal proof that I have done that interaction with the website. I don't need to kind of, you know, hope that they're keeping good records. I've got the record from Yoti, but I've definitely done that interaction. Hmm. <clears throat> is, is there any, this, this may be a kind of a down the line component, but are there any inbuilt, I don't know, post sign up uh, data or access management uh, yeah. pieces built in? I yeah, can can you the, revoke that at some point? Yeah, I think one of the nicest things is that first time you basically are sharing your, your key details, your name, your date of birth, whatever they and you feel comfortable to do the share. But after that, I'm effectively only sharing a kind of a returning user ID each time to that site. So I'm not having to basically continually share usernames and passwords, and I'm not having to keep on sharing my name and date of birth each time for them to match up. That's all done through that unique identifier, which basically is only um, used by myself with that one particular website. If I want to use another website, it's a completely different, unique identifier. So I'm no longer at risk of choosing a bad password or an easy password and finding that if I'm compromised with that password at one website, that the bots are basically going to start looking around the rest of the web and see whether I put that into many other websites as well. Do I understand you're doing some work with the government of Jersey? Yes. Yeah, so um, we have won a contract with... Uh, the government of Jersey um, and they have effectively said that if you're a Jersey citizen you will be able to use Yoti as a, a digital identity which the government will recognize and you know the beauty of that is for Jersey it's a very low cost solution because they haven't got to onboard all of their citizens with a new 
system that they will basically have citizens who've got biometric matching of their face to their passports. Almost everybody in Jersey has a passport. And voluntarily, those citizens who decide that this is quite an easy way to then interact with government, they'll also be able to interact with businesses in Jersey and peer-to-peer. -peer. So those classified examples, dating examples, it's actually a really useful solution for commercial interaction between citizens, customers, and businesses. So the government there has kind of taken quite a bold move to say, look, we're, we're not gonna create our own identity system. That would be really expensive. Instead, we're gonna use something which is on the market and gives utility for consumers in a way that if it was just a government ID and you couldn't use it for any other interactions, it would be a less powerful, compelling solution. Mm -hmm. And I understand that um, that there are kind of countries uh, across the world to varying degrees interested in things like digital identity. Uh, India, uh, with its Adhar, yeah, the Adhar, system. yeah, yeah, has um, has have, have made some great strides there. I think you guys even may may be doing some work in India. But um, I mean, when, when you when you kind of think about you know the 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 world you know political landscape, are there are there some countries who are kind of uh, approaching this on on the front foot, uh, and you know where you expect to see more innovation in, in digital identity coming from. I think there's definitely a, a significant amount of innovation. I think probably 10 years ago, most governments would have presumed that they would create a digital identity as their own kind of government database system. That clearly has a lot of um, risks attached to it. And actually, most governments now, I think, are looking quite hard at the consumer needs to be self-sovereign here. We need to facilitate that. So, you know, we're potentially still going to be using the anchors from government to um, to ensure the citizen can prove who they are. But we're going to use the blockchain or we're going to use solutions like Yoti for a consumer to actually have proper control over their identity. I think that's going to that that's going to work well with citizens. There'll be some com countries who think, no, we need to provide the whole system ourselves. And, you know, um, that will work as well. But I think most citizens would probably like to take ownership and control of such a precious thing, um, have the government recognise it, um, ensure that, you know, uh, there are sensible rules around protection of data, um, but effectively, you usually find that, you know, the, the private sector will innovate more and create more kind of solutions for a consumer than potentially a government will. Mm -hmm. So Yodi right now works <clears throat> uh, exclusively with digital identities. Uh, I mean, do you see this as the future of, kind of ownership and management of other types of data as well? I mean, presumably we never get to a point where you know, every piece of information is somehow captured in someone's uh, you know, personal ID, but I don't know, uh, open banking maybe, right? Can you, can you associate your transaction history at your you know, current account holding bank with your Yodi ID or whatever the next iteration is and start granting and revoking access to that? Are there... I don't know, other pieces of information that would be relevant. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see where we'll go over the next few years. So I think some of the the kind of movement, particularly in the financial sector, to kind of go for open banking, that's going to allow, you know, a lot of consumers to either use, um, you know, particularly innovative apps to basically help them choose the right products, allow some kind of viewing of their information, potentially, um, you know, who they've been uh conducting transactions with before to give them a better recommendation for uh, where they should get their insurance or whatever it might be. But I think also it will allow consumers to almost kind of say, hey, look, you hold quite a lot of information on me and I want to basically interact with another business, not necessarily you know, a competitor in, in your sector, but somebody who wants more assurance that I am you know, definitely who I am, that I've been doing banking for a long time, that I've been being paid well for a long time, or, I've, or, or that I have got a salary each month. And taking control of that information and actually saying, look, I don't want that just to rest in the bank account. I want to be able to take that data put it onto my 
um, identity and be able to share some of that information with somebody else who otherwise is going to put me through a lot of pain to basically prove that I am on that income, that I have been living at that property, that I do own that title deed. There's a huge amount of things that I would probably want to basically control, which at the moment are in somebody else's database. But quite rightly, they're not going to give that information unless they're very sure that it's me who's requesting it. Presumably, as Yodi scales, you become a target, a potential target of a cyber attack, right? As effectively the, the repository of all this information because you're taking it away from other institutions who traditionally would have been holding it. Uh, you're doing them a huge service by doing so. But as a result, you end up with all this information concentrated in you. Yeah, what do you abs- do about that? Absolutely. So that was something we thought through very hard right at the beginning in terms of how we created the architecture for Yoti and also I guess even before that stage the kind of principles of how we wanted Yoti to operate and those principles actually have had a significant influence on the way the architecture has been created to ensure that we keep people's information safe and we ensure that they're in control of that information. So very early on we decided that the only person who should be able to get into their information on the Yoti app would be the actual person so yoti has no way of getting into the app for your information to either share it without your consent or even just to have a look at it so once you've onboarded we obviously do in that first seven days we we have a clean room where we basically have trained people um, who can look at your face look at your documents we do have Um, automated systems as well but critically we have super recognizers who look at that information and check that it really is you once we've done that we put a private key on your phone and to keep it relatively um, simple simple just for this uh, interview we basically don't have any way of getting into your account once we've put that key on your phone we can no longer get into your account. The only person who can is yourself with your biometrics, with your key. Once you're into your app to do that, you can access just some of your attributes which have been stored effectively in the cloud uh, by ourselves, actually in local data centers at the moment here in the UK. And we have no way of getting into that information. So actually a critical thing in Yoti is you, you need to basically have a recovery key so that if you ever lose your phone and say to us, please, you know, I would like to get back into my account. If you don't have your recovery key for you to then use your biometrics and your passport or photo ID to get back in to prove it's you to get back into a, that one account, we can't actually help yeah. you. So set up in similar ways some crypto wallets. Um, unfortunately, yeah. yeah, just like that, we have had to tell one or two people who haven't chosen to use recovery keys that sorry, you're going to have to create a new Yoti because nobody can get into that one that unfortunately yeah. you didn't you didn't yeah. kind of have a recovery key for. Yeah. Well, it's better than losing all your Bitcoin, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that's a really important principle for us. That you know we we don't we design the system so that it's extremely difficult. Nobody yeah. can ever promise that any system can't be, mm-hmm. be hacked. I'm, I'm completely aware of that, but we've made it incredibly difficult for even ourselves yeah. who created the system. Yeah. We would have to go around and actually get hold of people's phones yeah. and you know, without their agreement, try and get their live faces into those phones mm-hmm. and guess their pins yeah. and, and, what, and do all of that. What about, what about um, I don't know, wholesale access to an archive on on the data centers yeah so there is obviously a a a data set which is in our local data centers but effectively the, the the cryptography that we use if somebody basically got a copy of that database they would have to use brute force over a long time. And, you know, there will be a a day where quantum computing probably allows that to be opened up. But critically, if they ever opened up those uh, encrypted attributes, they might find your first name and they might find my middle name and they might find Rachel's surname, but they're not going to basically be able to be sure, well, is that first name, middle name, last name of one person or is that one person's first name and somebody else's last name because I haven't got the key 
from their phone because I didn't get access to that. I've got into the central kind of server, but I haven't got all of the keys I need to actually mm-hmm. disentangle this. It's basically just a mess of millions of records, yeah. but no way of actually putting it together and working out whose date of birth goes with whose first name. Mm-hmm. Where can someone use their Yodi ID today? So one of the most important things we did was we worked out that on day one, that chicken and egg is very difficult. So even before we win regulated companies and supermarkets and nightclubs, we need a way of giving you high utility from day one. So what we decided quite early on was to create a password manager. And it's a free password manager. And it allows you to basically start using Yoti on an everyday basis. And businesses don't have to kind of sign up. Effectively, we're just letting you more safely put your username passwords into websites without having to remember them. That allows you to put stronger passwords into play. And that utility basically is one of the driving reasons for people getting Yoti. But we have had, as I've said, you know, the largest nightclub chain in the UK has 7 million visitors a year. And um, in Bournemouth, when we launched down in Bournemouth, we had, you know, a lot of people who basically started using it. We've always known that young people in particular have said, why am I having to take my passport or driving license, you know, to places to show it to people without any digital records of what's going on? Surely this should be on the phone. So, you know, that's quite reassuring that those young people kind of think that would be a smart thing to do. And increasingly, I think a lot of people will think that's the logical way to do it. I think in 10 years, it will look fairly old fashioned to be trying to get your your passport out and just show it to someone rather than have a proper digital receipt for something you show on your phone. Robin, what's the best way for people to connect with you and find out more about Yodi? Yeah, so, um, you know, I have an email address, robin.tombs at yoti.com. So, you know, quite a lot of people uh, email, tell me what they like, what they don't like, what we haven't got, which, you know, hopefully we're we're listening to and uh, bringing to them. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, um, I'm not on Twitter. I'm, you know, kind of uh, somebody who kind of <laughs> doesn't want to reply to people every kind of two minutes. But, um, you know, we're a fairly accessible company and we have, you know, 200 staff. We do a lot of kind of uh, work kind of talking to people who are using the app if they're, if they're prepared to talk to our customer support. But always keen to kind of, you know, hear what they like, what they don't like, what they'd like to see coming um, so yeah, please do you know give the app a go and uh, and, and tell us uh, tell us what you think. All right, Robin Toombs, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks very much indeed, Will. Thanks for tuning into Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com. Thank you.